Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Speed Tips by Bob and Chad. Uh, welcome, you guys. Uh, we enjoy doing this, and we look forward to it. Um, what all is uh, happening at Weir's Machine, Chad? Oh, just another crazy Monday here. Getting the last, uh, all the procrastinators getting their cars ready to go. So we're, some of them still haven't ran thrashing, getting everything ready to go. But I see the season's kind of getting kicked off in Iowa there last weekend, huh? Yeah, that was pretty cool. We got to race at Boone and they got to race at, uh, at Stewart. And uh, I didn't make the show at Stewart. I'm not a big fan of Sunday night racing because that seems to have an effect on Mondays a little bit. And, and so I don't know a lot of Sunday night stuff. But Saturday night we went to Boone. Uh, boy, heck of a show. I mean, they must have had 180 cars. Um, you know, the guys there at Boone, they worked the racetrack quite a bit, trying to keep the racetrack in good shape. And, and uh, like I said, it was pretty good. Racing was good. Um you know, congratulations to Tim Ward on on his win there in, in the modified deal, and, and uh, Taylor Cool and her new BHE car won. Um, she uh, she looked good. I mean, she was she was pretty fast, and and uh, there was uh, a couple guys that were racing with her pretty hard, and she did a great job. I was very very proud of the job she did. She looked good. The car looked good. And, yeah, I couldn't complain at all about that. That was pretty awesome. Uh, I know she works pretty hard at it, and uh, so congratulations to her. Um, don't remember, well, uh, Dollar Murdy won the uh, stock car. Um, that's kind of a, that's just sort of the way the stock car goes nowadays. I mean, if, if Dallin's not up front, he must have broke. Yeah. So, man, that kid's fast. And know, Dad ran second, and I heard that they ran first and second again at Stewart. And uh, uh, Troy Jarevitz from KMJ Motorsports, he ran third both nights. And so they, stock cars put on a heck of a show. And like I said, the modifieds and the, and, and the B mods or the sport mods were, they had a few struggles with the racetrack, kind of getting things rolling a little bit. But uh, when they could get some consistent laps, they were fast and they, and they did an awesome job. Looking forward to the season starting. I mean, it's a, uh, Weather doesn't look that outstanding for this next weekend uh, here in Iowa. Um, the highs don't look super duper great, so I don't know if old Bob will attend. I'm not. I'm not. That that frostbuster thing is. Mm, yeah, I like to froze my butt off last weekend at Boone. God, it was cold. Oh boy. But no, it was fun. Um, my secretary and, and my son-in-law, my daughter and my son-in-law brought this nice brand new Ultra Force machine back last Wednesday. So that was pretty exciting. I mean, that was like Christmas all over again. So yeah. that was pretty cool. So uh, looking forward to getting to use that. And I, I think Bobby's done, I've seen a couple pull bars that I shipped out today. So he, he evidently must have used the machine. Um, my, my good pal Austin and the, uh, that answers the phone and does the shipping. He was ill today, so Bob kind of got nominated for all that shipping, and I'm thinking, man, Austin does a hell of a job. I, I need to really compliment him. Oh, like, boy, I, I struggle, and, you know, of course, you know, it's been quite a while since I've done some of this, so I don't necessarily know how the new credit card deal goes, and I don't necessarily know how, you know, UPS from what, the um, what we used to have, the screen we used to have is totally different now. And you know, I'm like, oh man, but we got through it. So I got quite a few packages out, so I was pretty happy with that. Um, let's see here. First question from Jason is Don't even have my motor back yet. Oh man. Hmm. You know, I tell you, I talked uh, surprisingly, uh, and evidently there must be some issues with some parts or something that the motor builders are struggling a little with. Because I talked to like three or four guys the other night uh, at, at Boone that were just there watching, and, and it's like, where are you at? Well, we're still waiting on our motor. We, you know, we had some, we're waiting on some parts and some stuff like that. And I'm thinking, holy moly, 
That would not be fun. Yeah, but. lots of issues, parts and materials. They told me this morning that one of the parts that we make, uh, I think we we sell it for fifty bucks, and the material went up to twenty two bucks. Oh wow! So yeah, huh? Not good. Yeah, it's a constant yeah. battle every day. Well, because I actually shipped a, a part today, and, and the website said it was seventy bucks, and the computer said it was seventy five, and I'm like, hmm. Well, I wrote a note. We need to check on this to see what this was. I didn't take a lot of time to research it myself because I was busy. Uh, Jim says he's still fishing and fishing ice fishing in northern Minnesota. You know, I heard that. I had a guy that I was talking to the other day, and he made the comment that a lot of the lakes up in Minnesota still have ice on them. And I'm thinking, wow. You know, my son-in-law tried to go fishing. I went out once, and, and it, it just the water still is. 42, 44 degrees down here, and it's just too cold. I mean, but whatever. Uh, it'll get warmer. Eventually, that'll happen. So, uh, do you scale and check ride heights with shocks connected? I find the inconsistency with the gas shock connected. I actually set everything uh, without the shocks. And now, if I, you know, if my rear shock is on a coilover, of course, then I have to set it with a coilover. But if it's like a sport mod, I, we unhook all the shocks. Um, the gas shock can be kind of finicky. And, and the thing that you, people have got to remember that once you're on the racetrack, the, the car really doesn't know what the gas pressure is and stuff like that because it's, it's, it's not setting in a, in a neutral state or in a static state anymore, so it doesn't make any difference. Um well, Joel, we're doing pretty good. I, it sounds like Chad's doing pretty good. I'm, I've been doing really good. I, uh, you know, like I said, I, I got nominated today to do, be in charge of shipping, and so I text Austin tonight. And said you're going to be here tomorrow, right? And uh, he said, yeah. He said, I'm feeling pretty much better. I'm like, well, this is good. This is really good. Two days of this, and I might be pushing it, but. Anyway, uh, Chester's got a question. I have a 16-inch centered quick change in my modified. The right rear drive flange is flat-faced with a short, short axle than the left rear. What's the reason for that? Boy, Chester, I don't. I, I don't know if I can answer that question, to be honest with you. Hmm. I'm not... Uh, you got any ideas? No, is it must be two different hubs then? I'm not sure. I've never. Well, it would almost sound like it would be two different hubs, but yeah, Chester, I really don't have an answer for you, and I'm really sorry about that. I, I have no clue. Um, old number seven garage, thank you guys for the knowledge. I put it to good use over the weekend, had a fast car, couldn't do without you guys. Well, I appreciate that. I talked to a guy in Georgia today that uh, I, it was kind of by accident because I had to uh, call him to get his credit card number. Well, lo and behold, he's a Bob and Chad tuner. And so that that was about a 30-minute conversation, but it worked out pretty good. I mean, he's a good old boy, and he races uh, UMP stuff. Uh, he's down in Georgia, and they're going to Ohio this weekend to race. And I'm thinking, wow, you guys get into this traveling thing. Ooh. Oh. Holy cow. Um, Dan, I'm setting up how much lower do I – do you make the right side? Um well, like in the front, I, I, well, you know, of course, and I measure you know, on my right heights. When I measure the front end, I measure from the, the the control arm bolt to a level surface or the floor, and I always run my my right side, my right front, three eighths of an inch lower than I do my left front, and that's at a pretty close angle. In the rear, it's uh, a half an inch. I run the right sides a half an inch lower than the left side. And the left side with the spring load and stuff is going to be higher automatically. 
Um, Sean, I'm not going to tell you who I was talking about because to be honest with you, I don't even remember the guy's name because it was such a busy day, so I couldn't really tell you. Uh, on a stock car that's tight only on entry, what is the most effective way to adjust that issue without compromising handling on the other points of the racetrack? Well, a lot of times if the stock car is tight on entry, it's because it's getting on the right rear too quickly, and, and what's happening is, is it's getting too much side bite too fast. Um, I highly recommend um, putting a half-inch wheel spacer on the right side. That seems to work out pretty good. Um, you know, we played with that a little bit the other night on one stock car guy that we had and it seemed to help his car quite a bit. He was a little tight getting in. Now, as the feature went on, because, you know, they ran after the sport mods and ran after the modified, so we talked him into taking it off, and his car was pretty good all night long. But in the beginning of the evening, it, it was too tight. He was, uh, wasn't super tight, but it was just enough that the car wouldn't rotate, and that seemed to help it rotate quite a bit. Okay. Sorry, guys. Um, Josh. Hi, Josh. How's things going in, in Nebraska tonight? Um, on a sport mod, if that track slicks off, and stays smooth. If a guy stiffens the right rear spring, is that a good idea? Also, what about lowering the right rear bar on the chassis and moving it up a click on the rear end on the cage? Um, don't do them both. Uh, one is a significant change. Um, I don't know if I would stiffen the spring for a slick racetrack. Um, those cars are pretty sensitive. Um, raising that up on the uh, on, on the Weir's cage or the, the bracket, that works really well. Uh, we do that quite a bit when the racetrack gets real slick. It's going to tighten it up quite a bit getting in, but it's really going to tighten it up coming off, and it's going to definitely give you, you know, give you some traction. Ryan, only thing I can think of is some of some used to those flat faced drive flanges that put axles in inside the hub to even out the axle twist from uh, side to side or case of a short right rear, it would have less twist to, to allow it to drive off the corner off the right rear more. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, that's a good, very good point, Ryan. Thanks. Thanks a lot for chiming in here and letting us know that. So, uh, you know, that's definitely a, a possibility. You bet. Uh, UMP Pro Mod. During practice at fairly, fairly ha fast, heavy race car, or fast, heavy track, car felt like it was laying on the right rear as opposed to rolling off the right front. Um, on that type of racetrack, you know, it's very possible you could probably use a little bit more spring. Um, once again, wheel spacer on that right rear or half an inch might help that quite a bit. Um, what's your opinion, Chad? I'd say that's probably about right. Um, trying to think what else I would do. That's probably the two main things. Is I, I, I'd first I'd try that half inch spacer, but then I, I'd probably stiffen that right rear spring up a little bit. That's going to actually tighten the car a little bit, but at least when you get back to the throttle, it'll let the car help itself rotate. Uh, Andrew, on an IMC modified one, setting birdcage distance from the quick change bell. How much toe should I have on the four bars from the cage to the chassis mounts? Now, what's your opinion on that? We talked about that a couple weeks ago. So on the, on the left rear, you want the bars fairly straight. Uh, the left rear gets so much motion that 
if you start with them towed in to get that little extra traction when you get all hiked up and go through the motion the bars are going to have a lot of stress on them so we don't want them bars to get real angled in there you're going to bind your spacers and, and whatnot so left rear pretty much start straight when you're looking at it from the back at ride height the right rear uh, goes through some pretty good motion too when the car rolls over the right rear bottom rod we generally tow straight or in just slightly towards the left front but the top has to have quite a bit of tow because as that rear end moves and the car rolls over that suspension cage that right bar actually uh, goes through a lot of motion too so the top right rod should have about an inch towards the left front tire um, otherwise that thing if you start that right rear straight and that thing rolls over and it points that bar towards the door of the race car then when you pick up the fuel you're going to have a push in the car so uh, bar tow is very important uh, and definitely needs to be addressed it's set at ride height looking from the back of the car uh, and that right top rod's pretty critical i seen a, a guy in vegas a couple years ago that couldn't figure out what was wrong with his car and and i went over there and, and he actually had the spacers flopped on the frame so that thing was like two inches to the right at ride height so when the car rolled over the thing was pointing towards the middle of the door and every time you picked up the gas it just made the car shove so Bartow is definitely very important and needs to be addressed yeah it definitely needs to be set correctly and that was that i i would completely agree with what you just had to say that makes a lot of sense but i own a harris chassis number 919 and race it in the imca sport mod division well, I'll tell you what, those cars in, in that era were pretty darn good race cars um, with two link rear suspension on them when we were running on as an A mod. And uh, they're, they're still good old cars. And so, congratulations, bud. That's, uh, that old, that, that's back in the day there, 919. That's, that's uh, a ways back. I think when I sold. Sold the company. We were at about 2,200, I think it was 2,000, 2,200 in that neighborhood. So, so yeah, pretty cool. Well, glad to know, bud. I'm glad you brought that to my attention. Uh, Jim's got a great point, and that's what I was trying to think of. Uh, J-bar adjustment better to do it on the frame side for the pinion. Well, in my opinion pinion i usually do it on the pinion because you can do a half inch adjustment on the pinion and that's a fairly significant change but back to the previous gentleman that was talking about the car being tight on corner entry that was another adjustment that we could have mentioned to you um, that uh, if the car is really tight on the right rear raise the j-bar up a little bit um, that definitely will take some of that side bite out of the car. Um, Stefan wants to know, Chad, do you sell a cambered right rear hub setup for a floater 9-inch Ford? If, if you don't, do you know who does? Whoa. We don't. We don't make any hubs, um, and I don't know. The, the cambered stuff, I'm not sure if it's legal or not. Um, I know that's an asphalt thing. Some asphalt cars run that, but uh, as far as dirt stuff, I'm not sure who would have that available. Yeah, I'm not that familiar with it because I know, you know, in IMCA stuff, we're not supposed to have it. And, and so, uh, um, yeah, I'm not, not that knowledgeable on that one. Where to send you, Stephen? Um, Ryan, taking the four bar toe in or out on an older car where the mounts are much narrower on the chassis and the cage than current mounts should a guy cut them out and widen them out more and change the cages or just run them pretty straight for the for least bind well i mean if you i, I think you can achieve it without change in the car i mean you can slide your your cages around uh, a little bit too and i don't know whose cages you got if you have double shear cages with a little bit of room you know if you're running out one of our combos on the left rear you can't really move the cage around that much but you know if it's a left rear problem and your brackets are too narrow uh then you might have to cut it cut it off and, and move it around but 
generally can slide the cages around and adjust the spacers inside the suspension cage or the chassis to get the bar toe dialed in to where you need to be. Uh, Chester wants to know what our thoughts are on the tight helix right rear springs. Um, well, I think that's a driver preference. Uh, the thing of it is, is if you've got a 200 pound spring, that helix, um, you know, that spring's probably got two and a half inches of dog on. We've got flies already. This is unbelievable. Um, that tight helix spring. When it coil binds, it's going to give you a ton of uh, side bite. The problem is, is it's going to take at least two and a half to three inches to get it to coil bind, and that's about the normal travel a right rear actually has. Um, some guys, like I said, some guys like it. Some guys complain that they can't feel the right rear with that spring in there. Uh, so that's kind of my thoughts on there. I don't, you know. The two new cars that we put together this year, stock cars, we put regular springs in them. Uh, we sell them. We, we have them on the shelf. But like I said, it's kind of, from what I've kind of come to the conclusion, it's a little bit of a driver preference on how you want the right rear to feel. Yeah, it has to do with how much travel you're getting to. I don't know if you're a stock car or a modified, but in a modified, you know, if you're only getting, what are you getting on the right rear? Two inches, maybe? Two inches, yeah. You know, that tight helix spring needs about three, three and a half inches to do a, a rate change to what the tight helix is supposed to do. So when you're when you're comparing a 225 pound spring and you're going two inches of travel, a tight helix versus a standard spring is going to be the same until you get to that tight helix to where you're coil binding the coils. So you really, really got to be careful what you're doing there and, and make sure you know how much you're traveling to know if that tight helix is going to be a benefit or not. And. You know, certainly if you're on a rough track, I wouldn't even think about putting it in. And I know the modified guys, I don't see as many modified guys running that spring as I do stock car guys. And I yeah. know from our customers, the ones that we sell it to most of the time is, is a stock car customer. Um, let's see. Um, Stefan, by the way, thanks for all the info in the stock car class back in February. Uh, between what I learned there and with my chassis, I took my 20 year old hobby stock car out and made the A main in, in the street stock class. There was some stout cars in there. Well, that's awesome, Stefan. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, we enjoy those classes. I, uh, I like to help people out. And same with Chad. I mean, we, you know that's kind of what what we're here to do is help people go faster and and uh and that's that's kind of what this racing thing's all about i mean the, the better we can make you guys the better the show is for the fans and the more fans we get i mean it's just a trickle down effect all the way through okay next question if Trying to help the car come off the corner a little straighter, is it lengthening the left side, shortening the right side bars, or vice versa? I can't remember. Well, either one's going to do the same thing, but if you're running an IMCA modified or an IMCA um, sport mod, you're going to want to, to put lead in the car or to make the car come off the corner straighter, you're going to want to lengthen the left rear. The problem with shortening the right rear, sometimes if you're right on that, that wheelbase or that motor setback and wheelbase deal, you could, you know, they could measure you and come up that you're a quarter of an inch too short and, and disqualify you. So I always lengthen the left side. Travis, is, is there a desired amount of weight wanted on the right rear springs? For example, a 13-inch, 200-pound spring compressed to... 11 inches at ride height um that that's that's pretty common i mean it's uh, you know a 200 pound spring that's that's pretty common you know compressing that thing 11 11 and a quarter inches that's pretty pretty normal um now if you get into the you know the the 16 inch 100s i mean it's you're going to compress that thing 
twice as much, and that's about what they do. I mean, they compress them, you're compressing two inches, uh, like a 100 pound spring, we're going to compress that thing about four inches. Uh, Ryan, Bob, we felt like the spring had more energy on the rebound side of the spring. Would the shock with a little bit more rebound on the right front help that setup? Right, right. Yeah, normally. What goes? What you say? Right rear. On the right, or right rear. Um, we do that when the racetrack's got fairly slick. Um, if you've got a fairly heavy cushion or you're going to run up against the cushion, you wouldn't want more rebound in that right rear. But if racetrack slicks off, you know, like it was at Boone the other night, having more rebound in the right rear just helps the car come up off the corner better. Uh, that's a, that's a very good adjustment. Uh, that right rear does quite a bit uh, coming up off the corner when you can hold it down. What you're doing is you're delaying the action of the right rear to get up to the angle of the bars, and so you're delaying the right rear traction. And in reality, when you do that, you increase left rear traction. So that's kind of the objective. Um, how much caster gain on a Wasota A mod? Well, you know, as a rule of thumb, um, those cars run in the neighborhood of the degree. Uh, it kind of depends on your your chassis builder because there's no not real one complete answer anymore. Um, I know we've never tried to get over that degree because that's that's too too responsive. But it, like I said, kind of depends on the chassis with the uh, length of the upper A-frame and, and and all that stuff it can it can kind of change. So, what what have you heard, Chad? You know? I'm not uh, I'm not up on the caster gain on the on the front ends at all, other yeah. than what you preach at the schools. Right. No, I I mean a degree is pretty normal. Uh, that's kind of pretty standard. Um, don't forget everybody, if it's 112 days to the Harris Clash, only 112 days to the Harris Clash. We'll be here Look before forward. we know it. What? we will be here before we know it. Oh, yeah. Trust me. Yeah, it won't be long, and I'll be complaining about those 98-degree temperature days. And yeah, yeah, it's just, you know, that weather thing gives you an excuse to complain about something. You know, that's just kind of the way it goes. But, uh, but no. Well, we got some time. Can I have any other questions? Uh, do I have any other questions? Oh, I'm at the bottom of the question. Um those of you, if any of you out there didn't get a chance to come to the schools or whatever this last winter, uh, you can still get the school online at uh, uh, racetechinfo.com. Uh, they're still available, so if anybody needs anything like that. Uh, well, any new projects you're working on, Chad? We're working on that lower tool. For oh, sure. yeah. That'll be awesome. Yeah, that'll be as that'll be a common seller, no doubt about that. That's something everybody needs. Um, twenty twenty GRT. I'm burning up the right rear tire, but nothing on the left rear. Any suggestions? Um, you know, those cars tend to get on the right rear pretty pretty good. Um, you know, just need to uh, um, work with a little bit of trail. I mean, a little bit of lead in the car, um, a little more load in that left rear spring. Um, those two things would, would be a big help. You know, not knowing where your bars are set or any other thing. Um, that's it's kind of an open-ended question that, you know, I'd almost need to have you give me more information on what, where you're at and what to change. Uh, what's the response to the traction bar in your cars? I have a 2019 BHE GRT. Do you move it around or anything? Uh, Kevin, no, we don't. I actually put that bar in there. It's, it's kind of a chassis stiffener. 
Um, and it does definitely help traction because if you kind of look at the way that thing is actually diagonal and the way the car is built, what that does is it kind of takes the energy from the right front, moves it up to the, the piece of square tubing where the pull bar actually mounts to, and it kind of takes that energy back and then off to the left rear. So it just seems to keep the left rear loaded more. It just takes a little chassis flex out of the car. Um, Jim, how much tow on rear bars on a B mod with the direction? Well, on those particular cars, I've always towed my left rear in two inches, and I've always run my right rear in an inch. That seems to work pretty good. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty consistent number, so that's kind of what what we recommend. Well, we got some more time for some questions. Um, I can't think of any other subjects that we haven't talked about. Is the Race Tech Info website membership? How's that going? Is that available too? Uh, that, that works pretty good. Um, you know, the uh, racetechinfo.com, you've got the, uh, um, the site that you can subscribe to that gives you all kinds of videos. Um, I've kind of been slacking a little on that because, of course, my video guy is doing something different nowadays, and I'm actually interviewing a video guy tomorrow, uh, guy for a summer internship from Iowa State. Uh, so we're hoping that we can get back on that and produce some more videos. I've got a list of videos to do that I want to do. Um, I just need to get we can actually, you know, with the staff that I have, we can actually take all the raw material. We just need somebody to put it into context so that it is a presentable deal. Take out the snide remarks that I say when I said something stupid or, you know, those kind of things. We don't, public doesn't need to know my opinion on everything. Um, uh, Tyler, measuring tire temperatures, if one side is hotter than the other, does that warmer side need more bite added? That is correct. Always want to use the old adage, you know, and Kelly Shyrock used this phrase for numerous years. I've heard him say this, you know, feed the heat. If, if a car is, you know, it's just like the guy we talked to a little bit ago with the right rear burning off the right rear. Um, you know, the car doesn't have enough grip on that right rear tire. I mean, it, uh, you know, we need to load that right rear tire a little bit more and uh, uh, keep it so that it has, you're never going to get the left rear, well, I shouldn't say never. On a good handling race car, the left rear is probably going to be 20, 30 degrees cooler than a right rear just because of the side bite the right rear tire ends up having a lot more tire flex uh, as it goes through the corner and when you're flexing the sidewalls that creates heat and so um, you know another thing that you know maybe too low air pressure is creating you know maybe the tires get you running that right rear too low on air and it's flexing too much uh, that's a possibility too you know you might want to think about that uh, Bryce, fifth stock car. Car didn't have one original, didn't have one originally, was going to add one. What would be the sensation of adding it? Uh, fifth, fifth shock on a stock car. No, uh, I think he's talking about the pull bar shock. Well, either that or the axle dampener shock. He said fifth shock, not stock car. I think he's talking about the 9010 shock, I think. Right. I, I would agree. Yeah. Um, what that does is that actually helps the car tighten up getting into the corner. Um, I recommend, you know, depending on, and, and the valving is pretty, you know, it's just a situation where depending on what your um, traction device is and how that works, but, you know, like on a, a, a spring pull bar, uh, 
they tend to run a little stiffer rebound or a little stiffer compression. Uh, the biscuit bars, you got to run a little softer compression with those. But I always run a fifth fifth shock on all my cars. I highly recommend it. That fly is going to bite the dust here in a minute. <laughs> Mr. Miyagi. -um. I don't know if I got him, but at least I caught his attention, maybe. Um, anyway, <laughs> can you go over setting the indexing on the zero index cage again? Well, sure, Chad would like to do that. So the, the index of the cage would be set uh, one to three degrees into the spring at ride height. So when you get the when you get the bars moved, the top rod back and the bottom rod forward, then you would once the car is all ready to go and set up, that left rear suspension cage is indexed into the spring one to three degrees at ride height. Okay. Yeah, Bryce, I apologize about that. I, I read fish fifth stock car and it was a shock yes the axle dampener shock is a must in my personal opinion if the car didn't have one i would add one for sure um shane with all of the brake bushings on all of the pull bars should a person still run a pull bar shock advantage to running a pull bar shock how much uphill angle and, and towards the frame is too much. Well, I don't run over 10 degrees. I mean, 10 degrees is actually on, that's right on the edge. I wouldn't run a lot more than that because keep in mind, when the car is up on the left rear, you're gaining angle. But the advantage of that is, is when you get off the throttle, the car is actually going to get over on the right front a little bit quicker, but it's also going to get on the right rear quicker, which is going to in turn give the car more side bite. You'll find that the car definitely is freer without that shock on there. So most everybody tends to run that shock. And a 10 degree uphill angle, that's pretty common. Um, that, that's, a, that's a good place to start. What is the benefit of right rear brake floater rod on an A mod? Um, the benefit, go ahead, Chad. You can you sell so that part. It depends on how the how the rod's pointed. So there's there's some different ways to tune that right rear with the brake floater. Um, if the if the rod is going up when you brake, you're gonna load that suspension and make the car essentially tighter on entry uh, and if you flatten that down it won't affect it so much so the right rear brake floater is a little bit touchy uh, on how you enter the corner and how much you stab the brakes but that'll definitely put traction in the right rear on entry if the bar is facing uphill uh, i have seen some guys run the bar flatter downhill uh, to try and drive the right rear frame rail into the track but most of the guys are running, I think, with the bar at an uphill angle, so that would give uh, that would give rate to the right rear suspension, which would tighten the car on entry. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that totally because, um, uh, and the thing is, is like Chad said, it, it's a pretty sensitive deal. You know, the guy that's really good with a trail braking car and a and smooth getting into the corner with a slick racetrack, it can help side bite in that right rear tire. Uh, Heavy, rough racetrack, uh, I would definitely want to either clamp it up or definitely run no angle in it. Flattener, yeah. Yep. So what have the boys been up to? this? Would, would you guys have them doing anything exciting this weekend? Oh, we're getting ready for Turkey Tour 2022. I see. Turkey, uh -huh. turkey, hunt turkey hunt this weekend, yeah. Yeah. It was about time to get all those new trees planted out there at that acreage here pretty soon, isn't it? Got a whole bunch of trees coming. Yep. Yeah, we've been we've been working hard out there. Awesome. Um, Jim, Bob, what do you recommend for maintenance to brake pads? How often sanding the surface uh, or just scrubbing on concrete or cement? Um, well, I, personally, uh, I recommend you know, Every, after every weekend of racing, you know, if you're in one one night or two nights, 
the, the brakes are such a critical part of the handling aspect of these cars anymore um, that, you know, and sanding them on a surface, I, myself, we use our, when we do cars here at the shop, and we're like we get a car in here that people want us to completely go through and maintenance. We've got a, uh, I don't know what you call it, but it's a big 12 inch by 12 inch by four inch surface plate type thing that we put sanding paper on top of. And that's what we actually sand them off of. Yeah, the concrete works. I mean, that's what a lot of people do that. It just kind of gives it some, uh, takes some of that glaze off there because the, the glaze, you know, can, and, and this is actually a good, good comment because that guy this weekend that uh, he ran hot laps and he didn't have brakes to the second two to the two two one of the two last laps that he ran. And I asked him, I said, so what did did you by any chance scrub up the brakes when you first started? I mean, when you put them on, did you just bolt them on or did you rough them up a little bit? No, he said, I just bolted them on. Well, sometimes, you know, and the other thing is, is like when you put new rotors on the car, these cars, these rotors come with oil on them or it's a, it's a kind of a sealer type thing on so they don't rust. And so you need to take some lacquer thinner and go through and clean all those rotors up too. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. Um, I always even rough the rotors up. I just, we've got an orbital sander and I'll just spin those rotors and just put a little context back in that rotor too. Well, we've got uh, 15 minutes here for some more questions. If we've got anybody having any questions tonight. You didn't add stock cars to the Harris Clash, right? Just mods and B mods? It's just mods and sport mods, yeah. Yeah, they, uh, they didn't want to do that um, because it would take the show too long. And that's the main reason. My thoughts are, once again, I kind of thought about, you know, doing the stock car thing. And what I actually talked to, what I actually wanted to do is have a separate night to, you know, and run stock cars and street stocks. But uh, um, they didn't seem to think that was or didn't, you know, it didn't excite them that much. And uh, so, once again, the Harris Clash itself, you know, Sometimes it's don't need to fix something that's not broke. So things have went smoothly. The shows have went great. Uh, we've had good car counts. Um, boy, you know, I mean, it's just uh, that show is just a, a must, must watch show. It's going to be on IMCA TV again this year for those of you guys who are a long ways away that can't come and see it. Um, yeah, it's just a good show. You know, I was talking to Tim Ward. And, in fact, he actually asked me if there was anything new and what the payout was going to be. And I told him, I said, well, we really hadn't completely talked about the payout yet. We're, we're still in the process of thinking that through. And, and so we've got a few little things that we've got to iron out yet. But other than that, it's good to go. Uh, Glendale, your thoughts on running a softer left front spring than a right front spring and how much split in weight on them do you feel how much split on weight on them and then would you be doing done would you be done would you need to run more or less load in the front did i read that on clear whoa no. Your thoughts on running a softer left front spring than right front spring and how much split in weight on them. And then would that being done, would you need to run more or less load in them? Well, you would definitely probably want to run less load in the right front for sure if you're going to run that stiffer, uh, stiffer right front. Uh, what that's going to do is it's going to help the car turn getting into the corner. And uh, we've got some guys out there that still run that. Uh, you know, the trend has been stiffening up the left front to kind of get, you know, the right rear to grab a little better coming into the corner and get the car over in the right front. 
uh, how much weight split on them. It kind of depends on how much left side weight you have. Um, when we scale our cars, it's not uncommon to be around 100, 110 pounds split on that left front. Uh, we've even had some, that, you know, with a heavier guy and a little higher rear or higher left side percentage. You know, we've been a little bit more than that. But um, with a low left side percentage, you know, I've always, in my mind, always believed that that number should be closer together. But but that seems to be pretty common with our new cars. It's about 100 pounds a split. Uh, any benefit to bolting lead on the rear end housing? Well, you know, it's uh, if it's legal, there's a definite benefit if the racetrack's slick. Uh, Rick, on the front of a car, is there any benefit to having the brake caliper located? Located on the front versus the back. Yeah, I see my screen moves when there's another question that comes up and oh. it disappears on me. God dang it. Anyway, no, there's no no advantage. The, the brake the brake system in the right front or the in the car is not gonna know any difference. It's gonna stop one way or the other. Unless there's a clearance issue, but I would think if you put the brake on the front, you'd have more of a clearance issue than you would on the back. It's illegal in IMCA. Uh, open cars, we make a front mount for like the, the Nick Hoffman Elite cars. He runs the, the shock there uh, in the back, so he needs the caliper gone for clearance. So that's the only reason it's on the front is for uh, clearance to get away from the shock. Everybody thinks that it pulls the right front of the car down, and that's a myth. It doesn't know where that caliper is mounted in that circle. It just knows that it's clamping that rotor and slowing that rotor down. Same with the rear. It doesn't matter where the the caliper is in that circle. It just knows it's clamping that rotor and slowing that rotor. IMCAA mod. Good corner entry on throttle, but tight entry when off the throttle in the slick. Um, Soften the left front helps, but it unloads the car in the process. Uh, currently, 100 pounds softer in the left front than the right front. Adding compression to the left rear shock keeps it up on the bars, but frees the car up too much. My home track goes slick with the cushion, so it adds. It's, it's hard to load out of the right side and still be able to run the fence. Um, Daniel, give me a couple minutes here to think about that one. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I mean, it almost makes me wonder the fact that with that 100 pounds softer in the left front, well, that's going to, I mean, that's definitely going to help it turn and i would think that that would help quite a bit but it, once again it is going to do what you say it's going to unload the car in the process um i think you would be better off running equal springs or even just a slightly stiffer one and then running a little stiffer right rear spring so that it kind of the, the two springs kind of work together and keep some right rear in the car that way, it's a little bit more predictable to drive, especially if you've got to run the fence. So that would be my opinion. I, I would go back to equal springs in the front, and uh, I don't know what you're running in the right rear, but if you're running a 200, I'd go to a 225 or, or something equivalent to that. Uh, I think it would be a pretty good idea. What's your opinion on that one, Chad? I'd have to agree. That's a lot of spring split in my opinion. Yeah, that's that's definitely going to make the car unload getting into the corner. Um, you know, I've never run more than 50. A lot of times I like to play with a 25-pounder, but then again, with the, the, the variance in the springs and, you know, and with that you know, stuff we talked about during the school, um, you know, the product control, they're all springs to make a $65 spring. Uh, there's got to be a little bit of uh, tolerance variables there, and, and 
So you can have a 525 and a 550, and you might end up having two 535s. And it's not any one particular spring company that's that way. It's just that's just a common, common thing. So what was you tell? You told me a little bit ago that you sold your 800th ultra force machine. 800th ultra force machine. Yep. Wow. Unbelievable. That's a pretty awesome. You're going to have to start having parties for these celebrations or something. <laughs> Jimmy missed it. He's like, hey, uh, yeah, I missed it. We built 800 on Friday. And this was, oh. this was on like last Tuesday or Wednesday. Oh, so we I were going to have, we have cake and ice cream, but we missed it again. So God, God. we got something big planned for the thousandth machine. So that's awesome. It's pretty, uh, pretty unbelievable. But, you know, we built a, built a good piece there and, and, uh, you know, the longevity is great. You traded yours in to yep. uh, get that baby freshened up. We rebuilt the jack, recondition it, make sure everything's dialed in. And then, you know, it's got great resale value. We'll sell that as a used machine and that thing probably won't even last a week. So uh, I'm pretty, pretty proud of the guys uh, uh, in the Ultra Force Department and Jason, uh, the guy that actually just chimed in. Uh, about the thousands machine, uh, but it's been a good relationship with Jason and, and our relationship with Keith Burner and Hacky Force. And you know, I think uh, Keith and us uh, we work together and we build the best machines on the market. And uh, we're we're really excited about the Gen Four. We got that out, and that's being tested right now. The manual graphing machine. So we'll have uh, I think we'll have ten of them ready to go shortly for more testing and then that gen four we're hoping to be able to sell them at super nationals so awesome yeah uh, that would be a good time for guys that have a gen one or a gen two or a gen three to upgrade to the the new gen four that's coming uh to be able to see the graphing and that kind of stuff when you get to playing with the pull bars and that and as you know you and bobby working with the pull bars seeing that graph and seeing that rebound line separation oh that's huge uh, is huge and and what you can learn with these machines and and the load sticks and you know we're just we're having a great time building this stuff and making guys win races and go fast that's that's what we're all about so really well, and the stuff. advantage of that machine is it helps you stay up on your maintenance so you can you can check your pull bar you can rate it run it 10 nights rate it again make sure that the loads have not changed so you can stay consistently on your race program and the same thing with left rear and, and loading that it's just uh i mean i i don't know how i would i wouldn't be able to run a race of course the problem is is i've been too accustomed to all these neat tools so going and doing it the manually way would be hard for me to understand so but no that's pretty cool uh simon wants to know is there any advantage or disadvantage to running a chain on the right front of a three-link mod limiting the load? Uh, no, I don't think there would be any advantage to that. I, I, I think you would, uh, the right front, well, let's, I'll rephrase that. If your rules allow. Depends on the rules. It depends on the rules. But if your rules allow, Putting a little bit more load in that right front against that spring uh, actually is a pretty good deal. And that's partially why it's been outlawed in some sanctioning bodies because you can't run load in that right front. But tying that right front down against that spring, there's some advantages to there. Uh, it, it makes the car a little bit more um, sensitive but it, it definitely, I feel it puts traction in the car and keeps that right front over on the right front like it's where it's supposed to be. Because we can do that with a shock absorber, but the problem with a shock absorber sometimes, if we, if we put too much rebound, it, it can hurt traction off the corner. So you got to be a little careful. Uh, well, that chain, that, uh, that might not be a bad idea. Uh, we used to do it in the way we built the shock absorbers in the past. And, but then, like I said, they... Now the way they check that, you've got to make sure that there's no load on there. Um, Gary wants to know, what's going to happen if I redrill my right rear lower rear birdcage so that it, 
It's behind your original location at four and a half inches. Well, it depends on, I don't know if you have room to drill that. I don't know what plate of ours you have. Kind of looking at the plates right now. Uh, I mean, you can drill a hole wherever you want to. I don't know uh, what you're thinking there going behind center line, but if it's a two link car, uh, putting a longer arm on would definitely be an advantage. But I mean, if there's meat in the plate, go ahead and drill a hole. It ain't going to hurt anything. Um, yeah, they're up above too. AJ Springborn and Brian Bryce Carter. Questions? Oh, I missed them. When it was shuffling there. You... Oh. See AJ. Okay, got it. Uh, what's your thoughts on the hundred pound left rear spring in a sport mod? Was it compressed enough so that it stays compressed all the way through the corner at full hike? Um, I know there's some guys that are running some of that stuff. From my opinion, by watching them, some of them are a little more inconsistent. But the theory behind that, keep in mind, the, the left rear spring, when you're on the throttle, all of your traction is all off of your lower bar um, because there's no load on that spring. And that's why people went to those softer springs because when you get off that, if you've got load on that spring, the car won't fall so much and it won't, it'll keep the steer in the car. So in my opinion, I think it's a pretty good idea. I don't think it's one of those deals where you just bolt it in from what I understand, when you go softer on that left rear, you need to go stiffer on the left front because um, we're, you know, just to keep the car on. When you go softer with that left rear and you put a bunch of load in it, it's going to make the right rear free. So when you do that, then we almost have to put more spring in the left front to keep side bite in that right rear. So I think the left rear is a good idea. I don't think it's one of those deals that's completely just to bolt in, throw it in there, and go race it. Uh, I think you'll find there's going to be some other adjustments you'll have to make, and I know that left front spring is one of them. Um, Bryce, thanks for the first answer. Yes, it's a name mod. Bob, this car always drives really straight and tight on entry with a 200 or a 175 right rear spring. Put a 150 in the right rear, finally felt like it was rolling over far enough and would rotate on its own. What's your thoughts? Is that too soft? Well, that's a pretty soft right rear spring. Uh, I would almost feel like the car would roll over and lay there. It would make the car feel lazy. Um if the car's not rolling on that 200 or that 175, um, raise some of your static weight up, like the lead, raise that a little higher. Um, you know, do some other things like raise your uh, left side right heights a little bit, lower the right side right heights a little bit. Just kind of get it so that it naturally tries to tip over there. Um, the other thing is, is make sure that your uh, spring table is correct. Make sure that that right rear uh spring is not too high in the car which is going to restrict the car to roll a little bit um any thoughts chad you nailed it right there okay we did jason uh, matt on the front of a hobby stock do you see a benefit to a 12 inch left front spring or a 12 inch right front versus 11 inch um 1100 um matt i don't think i actually don't know if you'd notice the difference to be honest with you with, with run that, the short one yeah i would run the short one myself spring, because spring table yep. yeah the spring table is going to be down lower and that's going to be a better benefit um Yo, Rockstar, he's been working on his race car. He's having some transmission issues. He had to race, he had the transmission in and out of there about 10 times yesterday and was telling me today that lifting an 80-pound transmission 
you know, and I was going to tell him that he's probably just getting old. I mean, you know, what the heck? 80 pounds, 10 times up in the air. I mean, sounds like an age deal to me. I know I couldn't lift it one time. Hi there, Rockstar. How you doing? Hope you're getting your transmission deal figured out. But anyway, back to Matt. I would run the, the uh, I, I'd run the shorter spring because the spring table is going to get the car on the right front a little bit better, make the car a little more drivable. Well, we're up on our time. I uh, want to thank all you guys. Great questions again tonight. Uh, um, hope you guys are getting ready to go racing. Hope you get to go racing here pretty soon. And and uh, we will, what's today? The 8th? 11th. 11th. The 25th. We'll see you guys back here April 25th for another edition of the Bob and Chad. And, you have a great night, Chad, and thanks, everybody, for watching. Thank you.